So we are on. All right. For today, I have a uh, theological, doctrinal, Bible message for us to consider and ponder, for which we'll be turning in the Scriptures. First, Genesis chapter 12, and uh, also to Hebrews chapter 11. The main point of the message, which I will support from the Scriptures, but that certainly goes against the grain of what most American Christians today have been brainwashed from childhood to believe, is that patriotism, defined as a feeling of love, devotion, unconditional loyalty or attachment to any nation state, is first of all a non-Christian, or rather unchristian concept, that is not to be found anywhere in the Bible. It is a concept that originated in ancient history as a means of inducting citizens to serve as soldiers or cannon fodder for the king in his quest to build an empire, and it is still used for that purpose. And furthermore, for the Christian, patriotism as commonly expressed in the world, and especially in America today, actually qualifies as idolatry. I've touched on this in many messages over the years, but I've never focused an entire sermon around this issue, and I'm finally doing so today, and it's actually turned into a larger topic than I can cover in one message. So this is going to be part one of a two-part message. For the Christian, again, patriotism, as it manifests today in our society, is idolatry. The love of my country as a political, geographical area or body politic defined by national borders, uh, reverence for and loyalty to the state, patriotic duty, and pledging allegiance to a flag. All of these things are, in fact, idolatrous, unchristian concepts found nowhere in the Bible. And much to the contrary, the Bible clearly teaches against such misplaced loyalty as it manifests today. Amen. And that's not just true when a nation has become wicked as hell as America has become today. That was true 200 years ago in America just as it was true 2,000 years ago for Israelite Jews living in Jerusalem who came to faith in Christ and joined Christ's church. Their citizenship changed, as did ours when we got saved, if you're truly saved. And that is also true today for Christians living in every nation of the world. Patriotism as it manifests in the world today is idolatry. Before I go into the scriptures, I want to talk a bit about the history of patriotism itself. The word patriot comes from the root word patris. Patris, referring to a patriarchy or the descendants of a common father, uh, which is also where the term fatherland came from. Uh, this was, of course, true of ancient Israel, a nation that traced its ancestry to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, patriarchs, pa patriot. Now, that was also true of many other nations in Bible history, of course, the Edomite, Hittite, Amalekite, Canaanite nations, all of which were named after a common father. The term patriot itself arose in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages in Europe, and was initially applied to barbarians who were perceived to be either uncivilized or primitive, and who only had a common patris or fatherland. But then it later on, uh, came to mean loyalty to the state or to the body politic, loyalty to king and country. And for centuries now, the concept of patriotism has been expressed as nationalistic love and loyalty, and it has been used as a means of coercing a populace into believing they had a duty to take up arms and to become cannon fodder for the imperial ambitions of kings and Caesars. Of course, that's how the concept is used in America today as well. Right. In every nation, not just in America. For the secular so-called Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century, Europe and early America also, meaning deists and infidels, unbelievers like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, who rejected the gospel and authority of the Bible, for them, loyalty to the state was held in opposition to loyalty to the church. It was argued in Europe and early America that clergymen should not be allowed to teach in public schools since their allegiance was and loyalty was in heaven. 
These guys knew the Bible, but they, they rejected. They knew that the clergyman's loyalty, his citizenship was in heaven. And so they could not inspire patriotic love of the homeland and their students that these men were after. That has always been the goal of social engineers, to inspire patriotic love of the homeland. At the same time, though, some philosophers of the time recognized the danger of nationalistic patriotism. The famed British Anglican writer Samuel Johnson, who is referred to in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, as, quote, arguably the most distinguished man of letters in English history. He's quoted as saying, quote, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. The last refuge of the scoundrel. Historians also say that one of the main scoundrels that Samuel Johnson had in mind in saying that was a contemporary of his named John Stuart, 3rd Earl of Butte, who was an avid uh, proponent in Britain of status patriotism for the purpose of raising standing armies for the king. Those of you, though, who have seen part two of our video on America the Babylon may remember that name, John Stuart, 3rd Earl of Butte known also simply as Butte. He was a wealthy Scottish nobleman and a devoted Freemason with secret loyalty to the Jesuits and thereby to the Pope of Rome. Encyclopedia Britannica opens its article on Butte by referring to him as, quote, a Scottish royal favorite who dominated King George III of Great Britain. At a horse race in 1747, Butte met King George II son Frederick, who was then Prince of Wales, heir to the throne, and he quickly became a close friend, befriended him, moved in there. According to Britannica, Butte immediately gained the favor of the prince and princess and became the leading personage at their court. Uh, Tupper Saucy reveals a little bit more about this in his excellent book, Rulers of Evil. He said, when Butte joined the court of the prince and princess of Wales, their son George William, was an emotional basket case. Butte lavished attention on the lad, won his trust and admiration, became his mentor. Indeed, Butte made himself so delightfully indispensable around Leicester House that the prince appointed him in 1750 to the most intimate position on his staff, Lord of the Bedchamber. Nothing happened in the life of the two heirs to the throne of England, Frederick and his son, George William, that was not privy to a man under obedience to the unknown superior meaning, by the way, the Jesuit superior general at the time, Lorenzo Ricci, end quote. And so Butte soon became young George William's surrogate father, beloved mentor. A year later, George William's father, Frederick, Prince of Wales, mysteriously died, for which the rumor mill blamed Butte, leaving a very young George William as heir to the throne. After Prince Frederick's death in 1751, which many suspected Butte to have caused, Butte was then appointed by King George II as tutor to his grandson, Prince George, the new Prince of Wales. Nine years later, in 1760, King George II died, and young George William became King George III of England, against whom the American colonies would later revolt. At the time he took the throne, he was a dysfunctional teenager who fearfully turned the British Empire over to his surrogate father, John Stuart, 3rd Earl of Butte, who was in fact working for the Jesuits. Following the direction of a superior general, and just like the Jesuits still do today, while preaching patriotism in England to bolster the king's army, Butte acted swiftly to gain power in Parliament, uh, worked to pass successive acts of tyrannical taxation against the American colonies, to turn them against the crown to foment war, which later resulted in the American Revolution. That was the ultimate goal of Butte's Jesuit superior general at the time, Lorenzo Ricci. And the greatest benefactors of that war, the American Revolution, were the Jesuits and the Pope. Because the result of that war was the creation of a religious, neutral nation with strict separation of church and state that could therefore not ban Roman Catholics and Jesuits from holding office in government, as they had been banned throughout the British colonies. Quoting it one more time from Taprasasi's book, Rulers of Evil. Catholics owed allegiance to Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Rome, 
A foreign ruler who, as a matter of public policy, regarded the British king and his Protestant churches as heretics to be destroyed. To allow Catholics to vote or hold office was tantamount to surrendering their colonies to a foreign conqueror. A crucial part of maintaining personal liberty in a Protestant colonial America was keeping Roman Catholics out of government. But then came the revolution. The colonial citizenry fought for and won their independence from Great Britain. They established a constitution that amounted to surrendering their country to a foreign conqueror, the Pope. Before the constitution was ratified, American Catholics had a few rights. After ratification, they had them all. With Article 4, Section 3 in the First Amendment, the constitution welcomed agents of Pontifex Maximus, the world's chief enemy of Protestantism, into the ranks of government. And so, as a result of the American War for Independence, which broke the power of the papacy's number one enemy, the British Empire, and then by the subsequent crafting of the United States Constitution, a new, secular, non-religious nation-state was born that from the beginning was somewhat a boiling pot of mixed nationalities and mixed cultures, and that from the beginning gave the Jesuits direct access to American government over which they later gained, of course, complete mastery, which they still hold today. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that point uh, later in the message, but back to the point. John Stewart, Third Oil of Butte. Uh, while being the man the Jesuits used to influence and to dominate King George III to foment war with America, at the same time he was preaching the false gospel of patriotism to the Brits to bolster the king's army. Again, he was the man that the famed 18th century British writer Samuel Johnson had in mind when he said patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. And of course, the Vatican, via the Rothschild Banking Organization, which controlled the Bank of England, uh, while at the same time faithfully serving as the Vatican's guardian of the Vatican Treasury, funded both sides of that war, just like they did the war between the states, to control both sides and to thereby control the outcome. This ruse of patriotism has been for centuries used for that purpose, to instill love, and devotion to a nation state so as to coerce the citizenry into believing they had a patriotic duty to fight for king and country, to take up arms and become cannon fodder for the imperial ambitions of kings and Caesars, as it has been used very well in America also. As an example, I included in your bulletins today a popular poster from World War I era. And so here this poster here with this forlorn looking woman decked in stars and stripes with outstretched arms and saying, be patriotic, sign your country's pledge to save the food. That was put up all over America to promote support for the war in Europe. World War I began in 1914 between the Allies, who were France, the United Kingdom, and Russia, and between them and what was then called the Central Powers, which is Germany and Austria-Hungary. Italy joined the Allies in 1915, and the United States finally entered the war in 1917. But during the war, food shortages were widespread in Europe. And even before the U.S. entered that war, American relief organizations were shipping food overseas. On the home front, it was hoped, and in fact, it was promoted as a patriotic duty, as you see here, that Americans would adjust their eating habits in such a way as to conserve food that could then be sent abroad. Americans were told to go meatless and wheatless and to eat more corn and fish and also to plant victory gardens so that they could can fruits and vegetables to send overseas. And so here this poster is just one example of how patriotism and patriotic duty has been used to motivate the populace. And of course, those who chose not to comply would be branded as unpatriotic. So the main point of the message today, as I'll now explain, is that while defense of our homes and local community from foreign invaders and plunderers is a necessary right, and a potential duty as well. At the same time, for the Christian, patriotism itself, as commonly expressed in the world and in America today, as love, devotion, unconditional loyalty, and allegiance to a geographical boundary, a geographical area defined by national borders, uh, to stand and place your hand over your heart when the national anthem is played, to recite the Socialistic Pledge of Allegiance, written by a socialist to call himself a Baptist. None of these are to be found in the Bible, and secondly, I believe, qualifies as idolatry. So turning first to Genesis chapter 12. Having covered the history of patriotism itself, I want to talk about our duty as Christians. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, we read, 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan, they came. God said here in verse 1, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, in other words, from, from your patris, from your fatherland, unto a land that I will show thee. Somehow the Lord appeared to Abram in a way that Abram knew it was the Lord talking, and he knew that he had to do what he was being told. We don't read here that Abram offered any patriotic resistance, saying he loved his country, didn't want to leave, or wouldn't want to live anywhere else. We don't see that here, no indication of that. Now, the Lord did not tell Abram what he was going to do when he reached his destination. He just said, go, and I'll bless you. That's all Abram knew. Abram obeyed the voice of the Lord. In so doing, we'll see next in Hebrews chapter 11, Abram, of course, later known as Abraham, whom Paul calls the father of all them that believe, Romans chapter 4. Abram here stands as a picture of Christians today who are called out of the kingdoms of this world to be citizens of Christ's heavenly kingdom instead. Amen. That is the picture here. And that is where the Christian's love and loyalty is supposed to be. Amen. In the kingdom of heaven. Hebrews 11. We the same call upon Abraham to leave his fatherland. In Hebrews chapter 11, where we read beginning in verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith. By the way, that means by believing God's word. By faith. Abraham heard God's word. He believed it. So by faith, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether or where he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles and tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. That much we know from the Old Testament text. All right? But then the apostle provides a prophetic New Testament revelation. Verse 10 the writer says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's a New Testament revelation here. We don't get from the Old Testament text. Paul's saying here that Abraham was looking forward to that heavenly city built on unshakable foundations that no earthly warfare could cause to crumble. And then he says that Sarah had that same hope. Verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him, the Lord, faithful, who had promised. Sarah had faith too. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them. They lived by them. They lived and died by them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In calling Abram and Sarah out of Ur of the Chaldees, and then out of Haran as well, Abram and Sarah were called to be strangers and pilgrims on the earth, meaning that they knew that the city that they were looking for was not an earthly city. They knew that any city that they inhabited on this earth was not their home. Not where their loyalty was to lie. Because they had a better promise of what is yet to come. Amen. As we do too. Amen. Same promise. 
Verse 14, for they that say such things, those who confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth, in other words, declare plainly that they seek a country. They did not seek an earthly country, but a heavenly one, as we are to do as well. Verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, if they cared about the country they'd left, in other words, if they were true patriots, as, and as the world sees patriots to be, then they would have regarded Ur of the Chaldees as their homeland. But they didn't do that. Then says the apostle, they might have had opportunity to have returned. They could have turned back if they wanted to. But they weren't, they were unpatriotic, as the world would say, because they were citizens of the kingdom of heaven. They followed the call of God instead, as we are to do as well. Paul says in verse 16, but they now desire a better country, and so do I. I want a better country, a heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. This text tells us quite plainly that the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 to leave his father's country and sojourn to a land of promise is a prophetic picture and type of how every Christian today who is called to salvation in Christ is also called out of his former homeland in this world and is now to regard himself as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If we are to be patriotic today, it is to be loyal to Jesus and his kingdom. Period. Amen. And that is why Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. First he says in chapter 1 that you have been translated into Christ's kingdom. And he says in chapter 3, Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, if you are truly born again, in other words, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Don't put your hope in Washington, D.C. and the election coming up this week. There's no hope in that. For ye are dead. We are to be dead to this world, Paul says in verse, verse 3. For ye are dead. We are dead to this world. We are dead to our former life. We are dead to the person we used to be. In other words, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. That's what we are looking forward to when Jesus comes. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. This is a recurring theme uh, that resonates throughout the New Testament, beginning with the ministry of the Lord Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, that our hope and our treasure, our joy and our love, is not to be placed in this world. Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21. Everyone needs to read this verse for themselves. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. By the way, where your hope is, where your security is, is where your heart's going to be. And our hearts are supposed to be with Jesus and his kingdom. In John chapters 15 and 17 then, remember John 15 at the Last Supper in the upper room, the Lord Jesus emphasizes how his disciples, us included by the way, have been called out of this world and are no more of this world than he is. First hour, Jade quoted there in John 17 where Jesus said, I pray not for them only, not for the twelve only, but for all them that would believe through their word. This is, this is for us as well as it is to the twelve. He says in verse 18, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Just like God chose Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He's chosen us out of this world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Then in chapter 17, Jesus prays the Father on behalf of his disciples. He says, verse 14 of chapter 17, praying to the Father, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus says, we're no more of this world than he is. 
Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. He left us here to do a work, didn't he? We're here to do a work. We're here to serve him. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We are no more of this world than the Lord Jesus is, he said. That's out his prayer to the Father. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. This theme runs through the entire New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul picks up this theme, this great truth, in most of his epistles, including as he does here in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, our sins killed us, the wages of sin is death, we were dead in trespasses and sins, but even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together. That means he has raised us up. He has resurrected us together with Christ. Quickened means made alive. He's resurrected us, brought us back from spiritual death together with Christ. By grace he is saved. Verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? This passage says that by the power of the new birth, the regeneration, we have already been united together with Christ. His death was our death to who we used to be. His resurrection enabled and produced our spiritual resurrection that has already taken place to walk in newness of life if we're truly born again. And therefore, we have been made to sit together in heavenly places. That means we are already united together with him in his kingdom. This world is no longer our home. And a professing Christian who does not hate this present evil world, but still feels at home in it, who loves this world and who looks to worldly politics and to worldly government for security or for the solution to his problems, and who longs for an America that he thinks one time existed and wants to make America great again, as if it ever was great, when from its inception this nation was conceived and birthed, planned, as the birthplace of a Masonic and a Satanic New World Order. All you got to do is look at the back of your $1 bill to see the great seal of the United States. It was done, it was improved in 1776 with all of the Masonic symbols on there of the New World Order. That was the destiny for America from the beginning. That's what it was planned to do. Right. The birthplace of a Masonic and a Satanic New World Order. That's what America was planned for. The Christian who places his hope in America and whose treasure is on this earth I should say the professing Christian who places his hope in this world in America has not been raised up with Christ to sit in heavenly places. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Paul continues this theme in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says here, by the Jew's standard, at one time I had it all, he says. I was circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, the touching the law of Pharisee, he says. But then he says he gave all that up to follow Jesus. This, is, this entire chapter is a great chapter that contains a great description of the resurrected life in Christ Jesus that we should all, if we are born again, attest to and testify to. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, what I used to count as gain, those I counted lost for Christ. I lost those things for Jesus. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost, by the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him. I want to be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, faith in his blood, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Paul says, verse 10, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection. I want to live in that power of his resurrection. I want to walk in that power, Paul says. In the new life that we're to live in Jesus. We were raised to walk in newness of life. We're supposed to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Let me know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And he says, being made conformable unto his death. 
If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead one day, future, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I want to do what he called me for. Right? I want to finish the course that he set for me. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, forget all that, and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Paul says, I hope you all think the same way as I do. And if, any, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. If you disagree with me here, God will show you. All right? Paul is saying there. Verse 16, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together with me, and mark them, mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. In other words, follow them and follow us. For many walk, as of whom I have also told you often, and I'll tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He's talking about make-believers in the church, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, and by the way, whose kingdom is in this world. Their God is their belly, their glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. He says, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Again, this is a great chapter. The entire passage here contains several lessons and enough material for several sermons. But for today, the subject at hand, I want to just focus in on verse 20. Verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned this verse in several messages in the past, but I've never actually looked into what the commentaries say about it, which is, in fact, quite a bit. I'm glad I looked. First, I want to quote just a little bit from John Gill's commentary. He says, the Ethiopic version renders it, it was this verse, we have our city in heaven, and the words may be truly rendered, our citizenship is in heaven. That is, the city whereof we are free men is heaven. We behave ourselves here below as citizens of that city above. Heaven is the saint's city. Here they have no continuing city, but they seek one to come, which is permanent and durable. A city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We just read about Hebrews chapter 11. As yet they are not in it, we're not, we're not there yet, though fellow citizens of the saints, of the household of God, they are pilgrims, strangers, and sojourners on earth, as were Abraham and Sarah. He then quotes Leviticus 25, 23, cites that, where God said in the law, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. He said, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me, said the Lord. This world is not our home, God said, even to Old Testament Israel. So, in the same way here, Gil says that saints today are pilgrims, strangers, sojourners on earth. They're seeking a better country, a heavenly one, and God has prepared for them a city. Hebrews 11:16. they have a right unto it through the grace of God and righteousness of Christ and a meekness for it in him. And their conversation or their citizenship is here beforehand while their temporary residence is below. Their thoughts are often employed about it. Their affections are set upon it, Colossians 3, 2. Their hearts are where their treasure is, Matthew 6, 21. The desires of their souls are toward it. They are seeking things above and long to be in their own city and Father's house where Christ is and to be at home with him and forever with him. This is the work and business of their lives now and what their hearts are engaged in now. That's good commentary. It's a great verse. End quote there. John Gill says, this is what defines the Christian and distinguishes him from the non-Christian and even the make-believer or fake-believer. And I'm going to say that any professing Christian who does not have this view toward heaven and where his loyalty and allegiance lies 
surely has no right calling himself a Christian. I've told you guys before that I was not always a King James Bible man. I got saved in 1987 after immersing myself in an NIV Bible. I possessed that time. After a couple of years, I switched over to the New American Standard. After learning that, it's a much more literal translation than a paraphrase like the NIV, except that it's, it wasn't until 1994 that I actually learned about the textual issue that it was actually translated from the wrong text, the Westcott Hort Alexandrian text, at which point I immediately delved in and studied the issue, confirmed, and I switched to the King James Bible, about 1994. But two years before that, the Lord led me to this verse, Philippians 3.20, soon became one of my favorite verses. In the NASV, I've got my old NASV here. This is what it says in Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, and from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very similar to the King James, but it says, this does translate that conversation as citizenship. And so, when I switched to the King James Bible, though, I immediately had some difficulty with my favorite verse. One of my favorite verses that rendered this word as conversation rather than citizenship. So I studied it out, and I found that the word, that word conversation, that's translated from at this verse only occurs once in the entire New Testament, and it does mean citizenship. It's a good vernacular translation. Albert Barnes explains this issue very well in his uh, commentary. Again, as mentioned a couple of weeks back, Albert Barnes was an 18th century Presbyterian who broke from his denomination on a few doctrinal points. He was, in fact, tried for heresy on a few points uh, because he took the Bible far more literally in some places than his Presbyterian denomination did at the time. That was especially true with his commentary on the book of Romans and what Paul says there in chapter 11 about national Israel being restored one day. His 14-volume commentary on the Bible was published in the 1830s. His commentary on this verse is rather long. It's very much worth quoting. It's very much worth listening to. Because Barnes very much says that this verse is one of those that defines true Christians and separates true Christians from the false. This verse, Philippians 3.20. This verse separates, basically he says, true believers from make believers. He opens with a great explanation of that word conversation as used in the King James on the phrase, for our conversation is in heaven. He says, that is, this is true of all who are sincere Christians. It is a characteristic of Christians in contradistinction from those who are the enemies of the cross. A few verses earlier. In other words, false Christians. That their conversation is in heaven. The word conversation, we now apply almost entirely to oral discourse. Speaking, oral discourse. It's formerly, however, time King James was translated, meant conduct in general, and it is usually employed in this sense in the scriptures. He says, uh, the word used here, as I pointed out before, polytuma, is found nowhere else in the New Testament. It properly means any public measure, administration of the state, the manner in which the affairs of a state are administered, and then the state itself, the community, commonwealth, those who are bound under the same laws and associated in the same society associated in the same society. Here it cannot mean that their conversation, in the sense of oral discourse or talking, was in heaven, nor that their conduct was in heaven. doesn't mean that either, for this would convey no idea. He says, and the original word does not demand it, but the idea is, he says, that they were heavenly citizens or citizens of the heavenly world in contradistinction from a worldly community. They were governed by the laws of heaven, they were a community associated as citizens of that world and expecting there to dwell. They were a community associated as citizens of that world, in other words, heaven, and expecting there to dwell. He says the idea is that there are two great communities in the universe, that of the world and that of heaven, that governed by worldly laws and institutions and that by the laws of heaven, that associated for worldly purposes and that associated for heavenly or religious purposes, and that the Christian belonged to the latter. He says the enemy of the cross, though in the church, make believers, false believers in the church, belonged to the former. They're still in the old world, right? They belong to the former. 
Between true Christians, therefore, and others, there is all the difference which arises from belonging to different communities, being bound together for different purposes, subject to different laws, altogether under a different administration. He says there is more difference between them, true and false Christians, than there is between the subjects of two earthly governments. Isn't that interesting? He says compare Ephesians 2, 6. Note. In other words, the true Christian, he says, is a citizen of heaven, but the false, the make-believer, still has his allegiance and his loyalty and his hope in the temporal governments and laws of this world. And then regarding that phrase, from whence also we look for the Savior, he says, and this is where he breaks a little bit from Presbyterians in, of, his, of his day, that is, it is one of the characteristics of the Christian that he believes that the Lord Jesus will return from heaven, and that he looks and waits for it. He says, other men do not believe this, but the Christian confidently expects it. His Savior has been taken away from the earth and is now in heaven, but it is a great and standing article of his faith that that same Savior will again come and take the believer to himself. John 14, 2 to 3, etc. He says, this was the firm belief of the early Christians, and this expectation was with them was allowed to exert a constant influence on their hearts and lives. Mm -hmm. He says, it led them, one, to desire to be prepared for his coming. Two, to feel that earthly affairs were of little importance as the scene here was soon to close. Three, to live above the world and in the desire of the appearing of the Lord Jesus. Prepared for his coming, to feel that earthly affairs were of little importance as the scene here was soon to close and to live above the world and in the desire of the appearing of the Lord Jesus. He says this was one of the elementary doctrines of their faith and one of the means of producing deadness to the world among them. And among the early Christians, he said, there was perhaps no doctrine that was more the object of firm belief and the ground of more delightful contemplation that in their ascended master would return. Isn't that good? And then regarding those preterists and the liberals in his Presbyterian denomination that denied this great hope, Barnes then says, that's one reason he probably got prosecuted for heresy, it may be asked with great force whether Christians in general have now any such expectation of the second appearing of the Lord Jesus, or whether they have not fallen into the dangerous error of prevailing unbelief, which is, if you'll recall, I called preterism the eschatology of unbelief, which he says here too, so that the expectation of his coming is allowed to exert almost no influence on the soul. That's the way preterists are. He's, he basically critiquing his own denomination there. In the passage before us, Paul says it was one of the distinct characteristics of Christians that they looked for the coming of the Savior from heaven. They believed that he would return. They anticipated that important effects would follow to them from his second coming. He said, and so we should look. So should we do the same. There may be indeed a difference of opinion, he writes, about the time when he will come, about the question of whether he will come to reign literally on the earth, but the fact that Christ will return to our world is common ground on which all Christians may meet, and it is a fact which should be allowed to exert its full influence on the heart. It is a glorious truth. For what a sad world this would be, and what a sad prospect would be for the Christian if the Savior would never, were never to come to raise his people from their graves and to gather his redeemed to himself. The fact that he will come is identified with all of our hopes is fitted to cheer us in trial, to guard us in temptation, to make us dead to the world, and to lead us to keep the eye turned toward heaven. End quote. I thought that was worth quoting. That was a great commentary from Albert Barnes. I love that. This is a great commentary on a very important verse that this verse separates true Christians from false. If you're a true Christian, your citizenship is in heaven. You're not patriotic for America. I can say that, I believe, dogmatically. Now, that is about as far, almost, as I'm going to take this message for today. I've already gone a little bit long, I know. I'm going to be coming back to this next week to bring part two. For today, what we have seen is that our citizenship is in heaven. Our treasures are not laid up on the earth. Our treasure is in heaven because that's where our heart is 
constantly focused, if you're a true Christian, we have been called out of this world and we are no more of this world than the Lord Jesus himself, he said. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are citizens of his kingdom and by the power of the new birth of regeneration, we have already been united together with Jesus and like Abraham. We look for a city that has foundations, solid foundations, unmovable, unshakable foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We are looking forward to that heavenly city built on unshakable foundations that no earthly warfare would cause to crumble. Finally, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll close with this passage for today. 1 Timothy 6. We read in verse 13 of 1 Timothy 6. Paul gives Timothy a charge here. He closes basically uh, with this charge. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, he gives life to all things, who quickeneth all things, in the sight of God and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, says, Timothy, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Timothy, keep this without spot, unrebukable, until Jesus comes. Remember that Jesus is our blessed and only potentate. He is our King of kings. He is our Lord of lords. As citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the Lord Jesus is our one and only King. He is my president. He is our one and only lawgiver. We're to live under his law, not the laws of men, and to love any other kingdom than his, to elevate any body of law above or even equal to his law as all the churches today are doing and submitting their churches to the IRS to pledge loyalty or allegiance to any earthly nation or body politic for the Christian is not only idolatrous, but it is treasonous. Lord willing, I'll have more to say on that point next week. We look for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. We're looking for that Heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city of Zion, that's where we're marching, and that's what we'll sing after I pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you show us how we're to live, but you show us who is our king. We just thank you so much that just like you called Abram and Sarah out of Ur of the Chaldees and out of Haran, you've called us out of this world as well, and you've given us a hope and a promise of a wonderful future, of another city that we're looking for, whose builder and maker is God. Help us to keep our eyes focused on that kingdom. Help us, Lord, to set our affections on things above, not things of the earth. Help us, Lord, to remember these truths uh, on a daily basis and to keep our hearts focused on you and on your kingdom, to live for you, to live above this world and to live for you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.